The scripture reading for this morning is Psalm 78. And don't worry, I won't read the whole thing, just the first few verses. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to the Psalm 78. Psalm 78, a maskil of Asaph. O oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the story of your people, which you caused to be recorded in the Bible, that we have the record of these people who got to know you, and we see their strengths, and we see their weaknesses, Lord. We see their triumphs and their failures. And Lord, you caused those things to be put in your word for a reason for us to remember, for us to think through, for us to find patterns of what it means to follow you and to live with you and for you. So Lord, help us to remember the story and to be faithful in passing it along, to share it with one another and, to our children, and with our children and those who come to join us. Be with us this morning, Lord, as we praise you, as we listen to your word, as we fellowship together, Lord, we pray your blessing on everything that happens. In Jesus' name, amen.
Have you ever noticed that uh, many of the things that we purchase lose value as they age? My computer, and it is a pretty awesome computer, it's the most money I've spent on a computer ever, is certainly not as valuable in terms of its market value as when I first purchased it. And I've heard it said that cars and trucks lose a substantial part of their value the moment you drive them off the lot. And I don't imagine, though I'm not a farmer, that combines are much better. We live in a world that is obsessed with the newest and the latest, because we often assume that what is new is better than what is old. But there are still some things, some outliers, that actually increase in value with age. For instance, though I lack a discerning enough palate, those with a developed sense of taste can appreciate aged wine so much that they are willing to pay quite a bit of money for it. You know what else becomes more valuable with age? Friendships. Well, you can agree with me or disagree, but let's, let's just assume for the sake of argument that I'm right. Why is that? Why would, why would friendship be something that improves with age? Well, when you think of when a, a friendship begins, it's, it often comes through just circumstance. You happen to live on the same street, and you happen to like playing floor hockey or street hockey. Or you're in the same school, and you're sitting next to each other at a desk, or you go to the same church. And then you develop a common interest, and it can sustain friendships, especially young friendships. In fact, for kids, all you need to be able to do is to uh, throw around a ball or play whatever it is kids play. Uh, not house anymore, probably something to do with superheroes. I should know, I have kids. I need to pay more attention. As we get older, new friendships often start with an exchange of occupation and personal history. Oh, so what did you do? Where did you go to school? What's your story? And in a sense, that the story that we tell about ourselves begins to, it kind of defines us in a way. But over time, the friendships that start, you know, years ago, and they go the distance and they last, they gain value because they gain sh shared experiences, which translates into shared memories. When you experience something with someone else, it gives you a common point of reference. So I can say to someone I knew way back when, remember when we played floor hockey with the Chinese Alliance Church and that guy got his shirt ripped and he was so mad and how intense that game was and we can laugh about it and it brings up more stories and we talk about the old days and you feel a sense of camaraderie, like someone has gone through it with you. Someone else has shared the same experience. They know what you went through. Such things are comforting and they give you a sense of grounding. And as you see how someone else reacts to different situations over time, your memory can give you a sense of uh, someone else's character. You, like together with your buddy, oh, you remember so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, you know, oh, they, they were always late. Or, you know, or they were always early. And you know whether you can, you know, that so-and-so can keep a secret or, or maybe not so much. So there's a sense of a familiarity and ease that's, that's comforting and that's reassuring. So that works on the level of friendship. But shared memory also attaches us to larger communities as well. In our schools, we teach history, well, at least we used to teach history for this reason, not only to learn patterns of a human behavior, but also because it gives us a sense of shared identity. Even though it happened several years before I was born, I did hear about the Summit series in 1972. Some of you may have been there or watched it or listened to it. Yes, Paul, you did. You were there with the Canadians and the Soviets, and I wasn't there to witness it. I wasn't born until a few years later. But it helps me to understand, uh, among other things, how important a place hockey in particular has in forming Canadian identity. It's one of those collective memories we have as Canadians, even if you don't like, ho like hockey that has been passed down through the generations. And on a more sobering note, in uh, just over a month's time, we will mark Remembrance Day. We will pause to consider the sacrifices of prior generations. Even though, even though now almost everyone who has witnessed earlier conflicts, I'm thinking of World War I, has now passed. But when we keep the memory of these things alive, it helps us to value the things that we have today, the things that have been passed on to us. Now, I say all this 
Because in a sense, the Bible is a collection of the shared memories of God's people about their relationship with Him. And I was, I was saying last week about Abram's story, these shared memories that we have in Scripture become our memories when we become members of the body of Christ. There's something that unites us with fellow members from everywhere across the globe, from Africa, India, Asia, Europe, and North, North South America. It's something that brings us all together. It's some, a common reference. You can have a Christian from the other side of the world, and you can talk about Abram, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And these memories they are something that we hold in common, and they also form and they shape what, how we think and hopefully what we do. As the Apostle Paul writes to the Romans, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So when we immerse ourselves in these shared memories that have been passed down through the generations, the stories and the phrases will hopefully surface in our conversations with one another. And hopefully they will influence the way we parent, the way we do business, the way we treat one another. And more fundamentally, they will shape the way we think about one another and the way that we think about ourselves. And if you were here for uh, the last adult Sunday school, you'll know how important that is to have our thoughts shaped by what God says rather than what society says or our own internal ideas about who we are. And Paul writes later on in Romans, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Jesus and the apostles regularly bring up quotations and stories from the Old Testament when they teach. It happens all the time. If you read the New Testament, you just can't get around it. And you can tell how invested they were in the story of God's people. So for them, the Old Testament was just it wasn't just a random collection of stories, songs, and wisdom to admire or to enjoy like some you know, classical liter- world literature or something like that. It belonged to them in particular as the people of God. It was the collected memories and reflections of their people as they experienced God through the generations. Now, I've been pretty abstract here. Let me give you some more everyday examples. So when I was a kid... A phrase that stuck solidly in my mind was, have you heard this before? Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. I suspect I know it so well because my parents probably used it several times. And, uh, you know, the word abomination, it sounded kind of scary to my child's mind. And even though I may not have been crystal clear on what it meant, I knew it was something that was really bad, which in fact it is. So from a young age, I was impressed with the fact that God does not like lies. Now, you might kind of laugh or shake your head at at such a thought, but I believe a fear of things that are wrong or harmful is in fact healthy. Now, of course, you can take anything to an unhealthy extreme and make it an obsession, but in its proper place, a little bit of fear can be a good thing. To quote another proverb, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, alongside of such warning proverbs and kind of negative things and phrases were other phrases such as, for God so loved the world. And whenever anyone explained what this verse meant to me, it was always that God's love for the world included me in particular and everyone else that I encountered. God created man in his own image was another key phrase, though these days you'd best replace it with mankind because younger generations will have forgotten that back in the day man was used to designate not only men, but men and women alike. So I knew that God made everyone in his own image, that all human life was especially valuable, and that I shouldn't look down on anyone. Now, having such phrases firmly set in my mind was a good thing. If I was ever tempted to cheat or to deceive, lying lips are an abomination, immediately comes to mind. 
If I was ever tempted to look down on someone else, the knowledge that God loved them and made them would warn me or it would catch up with me after the fact and give me a guilty conscience. But more positively, these phrases encouraged me to see the best in other people and to see if I could discern the value in what they brought to the table. It wasn't just the phrases in the Bible verses, though. It was the stories that also played a role in shaping my mind. David's courage against Goliath, not something to emulate. Now, David's failings and their consequences were a sober warning. Daniel's boldness and holding on to his faith, no matter what, was something that I wanted to follow, was something that I wanted to emulate. Paul's passion for the gospel was something to strive for. And of course, when you encounter Jesus and you read his teaching, it just kind of knocks you over. It's, it's counterintuitive and you're kind of wrestling, well, here's what Jesus says about the kingdom. And this is kind of what I know from experience and how on earth am I supposed to live like Jesus did? And it's something that still challenge me, challenges me to this day. And as I grew older, and as I became a young adult and then an adult, and I read the Bible itself rather than my picture Bible, I found that it grew with me. Here were not only entertaining stories, you know, about uh, blood and guts battles and all the rest, but real life accounts of difficult and messy situations that clearly reflected the real world in which I lived. And when I encounter someone who has failed in a devastating way, I can think back to biblical characters who either also, also failed, yet by God's grace were restored, or refused to mend their ways and were destroyed. And when I find that I myself have failed in some way, I remember both God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness, and the danger of falling away. So the shared memories of God's people, inspired by the Holy Spirit and placed in the Bible, are there for us to treasure and to reflect upon. They should shape us as individuals and as a body of believers. Our children need to know the story of God and His people. In outline, that's why we read those little, you know, kids' Bible verses, books that are appropriately sanitized, and then in full as they get older. And if we do this in the right way, this story should seep down into their minds and their hearts so that it bubbles out to the surface unbidden, like a catchy tune that you just find yourself humming for days after hearing it, Oh, if you've had that experience. Now, if you have children, or you've had children, uh, they do this naturally. How many times do you hear children quoting the latest catchphrases from a popular movie or show? And even if they haven't seen the latest movie, they will do, they get the message just by playing with kids on the playground. For instance, when I was a kid, I did not watch The Terminator. Well, obviously. Well, hopefully, obviously, I didn't watch The Terminator. But I knew the catchphrase, I'll be back. You, you just couldn't avoid it. And, so, and how many times do they pull from their favorite stories when they play together? Oh, you be Elsa and I'll be Anna and then you can be the reindeer or whatever. If we don't provide them with foundational stories and ideas to base their play on and their thought upon, the world around us will. They need to know key phrases and verses that summarize how we see ourselves as God's people and the world. They need to know who God is, and so do we. We shouldn't study the Bible simply out of a sense of duty, but to have our thought life shaped by the story of God's people and the truths that God wants to teach us. Jesus says in John 15, 17, If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So when our thoughts are filled with God's word, and we allow it to shape how we act, we will be able to discern God's will. I should add that the shared memories of God's people while they are definitely grounded in the Bible, this is what we all hold in common, they are not, in fact, limited to the Bible. The Holy Spirit has not been inactive over the past 2,000 years. God is still with us. The, the history of the church contains, as you might expect for a history of God's people, brilliant and terrible moments alike. Just like the Bible records 
with unflinching honesty the good, the bad, and the ugly of the story of God's people, so the history of his church contains glorious and cringeworthy moments alike. You've got wacky heresies. We've got power-hungry leaders, racism, anti-intellectualism. It's all there. And as you've, if you've uh, been paying attention to the news, you know about Orange Shirt Day. And we, as a church, as we can look back and say, okay, well, maybe the way... Well, I mean, some of those missionaries did good things for the indigenous people of Canada, but those kids who were kidnapped and who were abused and who were stripped of their, their culture and their language, that was not... That was not Christ-like. That's not the pattern that he laid down for us to follow. And hopefully we can learn from that what not to do moving forward. So there, there are negative things, and we need to be upfront and honest about that. But there are also prophetic voices that are calling people back to God's words, calling God's people to do God's will. Even though we have people in church history abusing power, we also have people like William Wilberforce opposing slavery. We've got racism, and when we think of uh, recent history, we're thinking of the United States, and this is countered by the civil rights movement. God raised up Martin Luther King and many other people to say, no, this is what the Bible says about race. So heresies, and heresies, all sorts of heresies in church history, they're countered by the truth. And there's all sorts of untold and unsung stories that you have to dig to find about faithful followers of Jesus who heal the sick and care for those who have been devalued by others. So here too in church history are stories of encouragement and comfort and of warning. But where the rubber really meets the road are the memories that we form together as a local body of believers. Familiar words and settings can be comforting, but there is so much more to being the body of Christ than meeting briefly together on Sunday morning once a week. To develop collective memories that bring us together, we will need to share our experiences. And in order to share our experiences, we will have to get to know one another. And in order to get to know one another, we will have to spend time together. We will have to do things together. Now, as you all know, the past couple of years have, present, prevent, have presented many obstacles to spending time together and to creating those shared memories. COVID has prevented us from doing many of the things that we would otherwise do. We haven't been able to share meals together. There are limits on how many of us are supposed to gather together at once. This is a loss, a substantial loss. It has put a... It's an obstacle to our growth in coming together in unity. And yet, in spite of this, there are still things that we can do to be involved in one another's lives. Now, according to Alberta Health Services, quote, Indoor private social gatherings are limited to a single household plus one other household to a maximum of 10 vaccinated, vaccine-eligible vaccinated people and no restrictions on children under 12. So I'll leave it to you to translate that, and I won't try to influence you, but that, that's what it says. In other words, though, the, here's the positive thing. We can gather together in small numbers, and so we ought to gather together in small numbers. Meeting in one another's homes is something that the early church did regularly. Hosting one another is a way of developing shared memories, encouraging one another and developing the trust that is necessary for accountability. Now, I know that some of you may be opposed to vaccines for all sorts of various reasons, but then this is just a suggestion, just a respectful suggestion, that if your, reasons don't, if, you don't, if your reasons don't have anything to do with an existing health condition or a matter of conscience between you and God, that maybe you should consider getting vaccinated if for no other reason than to be able to meet more freely with God's people. Again, suggestion from the pastor, I'll leave it up to you. So in addition to meeting together as we are able, I would like to encourage more of you to get here a little bit earlier on Sunday mornings for Sunday school. While it is good to study God's Word as individuals and to read good books about who God is, it is also important to think and reflect together. Because apart from one another, we can miss or overlook things that other people will see. 
Apart from one another, we can easily misinterpret and misapply the things that we read. But if we, together as a community, we read God's Word and think about what He wants to say to us, we can correct misunderstandings. And together, we can work out ways of connecting and applying the truth of God's Word to our lives today. So in addition to learning and studying, which are good things, Sunday School also provides us opportunities to share what God has been doing in our lives. It's, you know, and if the Sunday School gets too big, we'll just break up in small groups and do it that way. But it's been a time, something that I've actually quite appreciated over the, the past few weeks. When we do this, when we are aware of what's going on in one, another, one another's lives, we can pray more intentionally for one another. So instead of just opening up the church directory and so, oh Lord, please bless this person and this person and this person and this person and we're done. Which, I mean, that's good for a start. It's good if you're actually doing that. But we can pray for one another with more specific needs in mind. We can think, oh yeah, that person has that health issue or that person has that aunt who is undergoing chemo or that person, they're, wor- they're worried about their kids in, in this situation and, and stuff like that. And then when we share stories about what God has done in our lives and what God is doing in our lives, we add to our collective memory as a church. We can go, oh yeah, so-and-so said that, you know, God healed them or God brought them through that season of doubt or when they were struggling or things like that. And and when we hear those things and those stories come together, it encourages us and it encourages others in our walk. So if you're going to go through something new, whether that be a certain stage in the development of your child or the loss of a loved one or a new opportunity or if you're wrestling with some kind of doubt, it really, really helps to hear from other people who have gone through similar circumstances. Now, you're wondering how I'm tying this into Thanksgiving. Well, here it is. Thanksgiving is another opportunity not only to create shared experiences, which I encourage you to do, but to revisit memories. As you meet with friends and families this weekend, take time not only to thank God for the material things He has given you and the relationships that you currently enjoy, but also for the ways He has worked among you in the past. Remind one another of God's faithfulness through difficult times and bless Him for seeing you through. Thank God for people that He has used to bless you and encourage you along the way, even if you have lost contact with them or they have passed away. Tell the story of your family to your children so they can hear it and know how God was at work even before they were born. It will help to ground them, give them a sense of who they are and what God has been doing in their lives in particular. So I encourage you, share your memories. This morning we have another opportunity for remembering. We have the privilege of sharing communion with one another. Oh, if you need to step out for a second, the communion little cups and wafers are in the back. I forgot to mention that in the announcements, but if you don't have one, you can quickly run back. I won't be offended. We won't stare at you and grab one and come back to your seat. Oh, it looks like you all got it. That's good. So the Lord Jesus has commanded, himself has commanded to share communion together and to do this in remembrance of him. We share the bread and the fruit of the vine because God knows that we are not just minds, we are embodied beings. We remember and worship not only with this, but with with this, with our hearts and our souls as well. And you know from experience that certain objects, certain smells trigger sensations in, 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 well, rather the sensations trigger our memories in powerful ways. For instance, whenever I pick up my trombone, which I've had for several years now. My body easily remembers the weight of it, the feel of it, how to move it, and though less these days, how to play it. And I taste a handful of garden peas, and I'm taken back to being in the garden with my dad. And when we take communion together, I often feel a sense of God's presence and a sense of unity with you as a local body of believers And with the broader church, with people from other congregations with whom I've worshipped. Because we all seek to obey Christ in this way. And I'm taken back to the testimony of the apostles. 
to those people who were actually with Jesus in the upper room for that supper. They were there. They saw it. And they passed down what they saw to those who came after, all through those many generations. John the Elder writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. So their memories, those people who were first there, are now our memories to treasure and to pass down to those who follow, to our biological, adopted, and spiritual children in Christ. And the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection continues to shape us, to correct us, to encourage us, and to give us hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the collective memory that we have of what of the great things that you have done throughout the ages. The memory of how you, how thousands of years ago, spoke to a man because you had a plan. A plan that would involve, just start off as a family, an infertile family. And you grew in that family into a great nation. And you taught that nation. You made a covenant with them. You gave them laws. You taught them about who you are, who you are. And just at the right time, when everything was ready, you sent your son to save the world, to die in our place, to make things right, to conquer sin and death. And now, Lord, we're a part of that story, and we are creating new memories as your body. And we're telling stories about your faithfulness through the ages. Lord, help us to encourage one another in this, to build one another up, to hold on to those memories, to pass them down, to make sure that we don't squander the good gifts that you have given us. And now, Lord, as we turn to communion, I pray that you will prepare our hearts and our minds, and Lord, help us to worship you as we ought. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's stand.
for those of you tuning in by live stream, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.